Okay, so there's been a bit of an ongoing feud in the Pokemon world, and it all has to do with this flipping thing. So, what is this thing? What does it do? And why does it seem to be the source of so much controversy? Well, a lot of people have said words about it, usually simple things like, it makes the game too easy, and so forth, but I don't think there's been a satisfying articulation of what exactly people mean by that. Well, as a critic who runs a whole channel about game feel and design, I think I can properly state what people are feeling about this whole thing. I mean, don't get me wrong, there have certainly been a lot of garbage takes on Pokemon games, such as, I think Pokemon should stop being turn-based. Well, I think maybe you should stop playing Pokemon. But, petty arguments aside, the story with the EXP share, I think, has some solid merit to it. First, a bit of context. Pokemon is a JRPG, or Japanese role-playing game, a game system where players and characters get stronger by battling monsters to gain experience points. Pick up enough points and you go up a level and get increases to your various stats. It's a game system that's been around since the 1980s and can trace its roots back to old school Dungeons and Dragons. So now let's come back to this item, the EXP share. Generally in JRPGs, it's only the characters that participate in a battle that gain experience points, and Pokemon was no different for the first 15 some odd years of its life. You want a Pokemon to get stronger? You have to use it. In fact, a common trick to level up weaker Pokemon back in the day was to put it in the front, send it out against an opponent, then immediately bring it back to put out something stronger, giving the weak Pokemon half the experience points with nothing lost but a single turn. With the introduction of held items in the sequel games, Pokemon Gold and Silver, we got the first form of the EXP share, which you can put onto a weaker Pokemon to get this same effect without wasting a turn. This version of the EXP share stayed consistent until 2013, where it was changed in X and Y. Pokemon X and Y introduced the modern EXP share, an item that, rather than going onto a Pokemon, stays in your bag and grants the effect to the entire party instead of just one creature. Sounds good, right? It means that any battle you participate in will gain you way more experience than normal. Well, it would be if the games themselves were balanced to handle this huge influx of extra power. Like, at all. Okay, so let's take a step back and talk about another JRPG concept, and that's grinding. Grinding is a common term for when a player goes to a location where battles can happen and just runs around in circles like Conan at the wheel in order to gain the experience points, money, items, what have you to progress in the game. It's a dirty word in the JRPG space, and for very good reason. Now, these days we tend to see JRPGs that are well balanced. Basically, whenever you reach a new area, if you gave the previous area a thorough once over, checking every nook and cranny for treasure and fighting every monster you come across, you can reasonably expect that you are prepared for whatever awaits you in this new area. Basically, the reward for engaging with the content laid out before you is that you are prepared for the next quest. If we do this on a graph, difficulty over time crossed with EXP over time makes a nice even 45 degree angle. But wait, what if the game you are creating is kinda small and super short? How are you supposed to make people feel like they're getting their money's worth from a game whose plot can be best summarized as fight these three big dudes then fight their boss? Well, by cutting back on the rewards, of course. Now, if you finish an area, you are not, in fact, ready for the next quest because you haven't gotten enough experience points and money to handle it, forcing you to return to the previous area and run around in circles when it's way past its shelf life. To quote an applicable, though not deliberate, phrase from Shuffle Master Aaron Hansen, Waiting is not a difficult thing to do, but it creates the illusion of difficulty because it takes up your time. This is what is known as embracing the grind, and it was the bane of older JRPGs, which frequently didn't have the time, budget, or willpower to create a more expansive experience. And the reason people hate it so much is that they aren't getting to partake in new content, trudging around in expired milk until maybe they can handle the difficulty spike the designers put in front of them to force this situation. It really says something about modern sensibilities that when an old game is remade, you can pretty much guarantee that the experience system will be rebalanced to fit the proper flow I described before. Though some games like Dragon Quest stuck to it for a long time and had to be dragged kicking and screaming into the modern era with Dragon Quest VIII. An excellent game that everybody should play, by the way. Though, play the original PlayStation 2 version if you can to enjoy the fully orchestrated score. 
But then the same company behind Dragon Quest VIII made Nino Kuni, which has just as much grindy bubkis as before, and... So that's why the EXP share was made, to reduce grinding. Except here's the problem. You see, like I just detailed, grinding is an artificial construct. It's a game design choice made by designers who want to artificially extend the shelf life of their games without generating new content. So it's not a problem inherent to the games themselves. Any developer can choose to just, you know, not include grinding in their game. Speaking of, you know what game series generally doesn't have grinding problems? Pokemon! Yeah, as it turns out, if you play the game to its full extent, where you find every item and battle every trainer, which you want to do, they're worth bonus experience points, then you should be ready to face the next challenge. This is pretty much how all of the games are developed, and if you're struggling in a new area, it means you probably missed a bunch of content somewhere. Not to say Pokemon is completely free from grinding. I can think of two places where Pokemon does have a grinding problem, and that's the start of the first game and the end of the second one. In the first game, you only get five or six trainer battles leading up to the first gym, which isn't nearly enough experience points to take on the first gym leader, and so you get stuck in a place called Viridian Forest and fight caterpillars for a few hours. It's why basically every game since has added places like Sprout Tower that are full of trainers that allow new players to get their act together more quickly. In the second game, you hit what I call the Blackthorn City Slump. The Johto games are sort of underbalanced in general, but then at the end of the game, out of nowhere, you hit a point where your opposition is like 15 levels higher than it was just a little while ago, and none of the wild Pokemon have enough yield to keep your team in shape. And so you have to embrace the grind so close to the finish line. Now, the Viridian Force problem isn't a total disaster. All the grinding you do there makes it pretty much inevitable that you will encounter and catch a rare and important Pikachu. So this grind has a silver lining. The Blackthorn City slump, though, is a total disaster, which is why they thankfully added a new area to fix that problem in the remake. But for most Pokemon games, you're basically supposed to go with the flow, where clearing an area out before continuing on puts you in a place where the next gym leader boss fight is beatable, but still a bit of a struggle and providing a decent challenge. You see, it's my belief that in order for a game to feel satisfying, there needs to be a sense of adversity, a belief that you can fail and where mistakes are suitably punished. And I don't mean like Dark Souls super tough easy modes or for babies pain simulators, even more mainstream games like Monster Hunter understand this feeling. Now, I'm sure it's old hat these days, but I remember exactly how I felt when I defeated my very first Rathalos. A particularly ugly and ornery creature known for being a huge difficulty spike to any new player, it felt, well, like this. <laughs> It is not at all unfair for a game to demand mastery of its mechanics by the time it is over. If you're faced with something challenging, then the win is all the more sweet, and a game that's balanced so that every boss is an appropriate challenge is one that will generally elicit that sensation. It's also rewarding to find other ways to manage this, like having a team of only five Pokemon instead of the expected six, calculating that the increased power gained by divvying up that sixth member's points between the remaining five will make up for the loss in team variety. So if Pokemon games are generally the baby bear's porridge of pacing, where any player that fully explores each new area can expect to handle the next one and feel the proper amount of pressure in the harder fights, what happens to this balance when you, say, introduce an item that dumps on way more experience points than normal? What happens is the opposite problem to grinding, where the normal amount of EXP given by the standard Pokemon experience gets ballooned to such a degree that your Pokemon level up way too fast and nothing offers a satisfying challenge anymore. Now, this wouldn't be a problem if the games were balanced to adjust for all of this additional power, but they aren't. People found out pretty quick in X and Y that the game was balanced like a typical Pokemon game, but the EXP share sent power spiraling into the stratosphere. Which sounds good on its surface, right? It means you're basically guaranteed to be powerful enough to handle any challenge, but that erasure of challenge not only erases the satisfaction of victory, it also erases the need to learn and understand the game's mechanics. Battles kind of become white noise, and gym leaders are nothing more than a normal battle with more dialogue. 
You don't have to pay attention to things like types or stats because you can just steamroll anything with anybody. I've actually seen places where people talk about how they just sort of forgot what Pokemon they had with them in recent games because they just were not getting used. If you want that same sort of dull sensation, try playing a game with a New Game Plus mode immediately after you finish a game, starting the game over but with all of your experience and items from the previous game intact, and with all of your characters strong enough to defeat the final boss. All those fights that were thrilling and rewarding before, which offered you the experience and money you needed to proceed, now are kind of worthless to you. They feel like a waste of time now that you don't need all that money and experience points, and they come across as more of a punishment than something to play. This is why so many New Game Plus modes kinda suck. Unless your game is made like Chrono Trigger or the Trials of Mana remake, where avoiding these fights are as much a fun gameplay loop as the fights themselves. The real clincher with X and Y is when you finally reach the big moment of the game. The powerful legendary Pokémon printed on the front of the box that the game has spent all of its time building up to, only to find that it's already several levels weaker than your entire team. A god among mons with the power of life and death itself! Outmuscled by a random rodent I caught at the start of the game. So that's the effect that the EXP share has on an average playthrough, turning the whole experience into this sort of haze where nothing really matters and no moments really stand out. It's not even good at helping new Pokémon catch up, since all of your stronger Pokémon keep gaining experience and outpacing any newcomers. But hey, at least you could turn it off anytime you want. If you don't want the experience bloat, you don't have to take it. A flick of the switch and you're good to go with the Pokémon experience you wanted. Then along comes Sword and Shield and they get rid of the off switch. <laughs> and before you ask, no, they didn't rebalance the difficulty to compensate. In my first time through, I immediately got 10 levels ahead of all challengers and I had to try to get that gap any smaller. It took the literal final boss to even catch up to me, and even then, his strongest Pokémon only matched my team average. Among the many, many problems Sword and Shield has, this one that removed the ability for players to tailor their desired experience struck a nerve. Though not as intensely as a lot of the other stuff did, but it felt just as arbitrary and spiteful. As for the development team explaining why they did this, they said it's because children have short attention spans. Ah, uh, ha, yeah, sure, try running that line past any parent who's being asked to put on Frozen for the thousandth time that week. Kids don't have short attention spans. What they have is a low tolerance for bup kiss. Give them something they like and they will fixate on it like nothing you've ever seen. So let me take a step back a bit because I don't think that the EXP share itself is that terrible an idea. I guarantee you that all of these people complaining about the EXP share now would absolutely chomp at the bit to get the exact same thing as a post-game reward. I mean, if it were up to me, when you beat the game and become the champion, you could get like a champion's lounge that's full of great stuff that you can just up and take. You've earned it after all. You know, make the game a nice, balanced, curated experience that at the end rewards me with everything I need to get into competitive play basically right away. I don't think anybody would complain about that. Entering competitive is your reward for beating the game. But there are still people out there who insist that the EXP share spares them from grinding, which, need I remind you, is an optional design choice. I think these people who complain about having to grind are actually the sorts of people who just waltz past all the content that the game designers put all their time and effort into making, and are resentful that they get punished for it. I mean, I don't know if I've said this before, but a game should have space to let the players make mistakes. Fair mistakes, though, not cruel punishment. Like, punishing them for not reading the instructions is fair, but punishing them for pressing the left button for two frames too long isn't. In this case, the mistake is being underpowered because you bypassed a ton of the game's contents that these guys slaved away at for hours and why are you just skipping it? Are you, do you just not care about their work? And again, it's not grinding if it's new content. So then why don't they just rebalance the game to fit the EXP share? Well, that's kind of impossible to do. Thing is, the EXP share generates its bonus points based on how many Pokémon a player is carrying. So a player who has six Pokémon will get a lot more bonus points than a player with only three. So it's hard to gauge the EXP share's impact on a player's power level, especially early on where that gap can first appear. 
This is probably the biggest reason I'm proposing turning the EXP share into a post-game reward as the solution to this problem from a game design perspective. Though the more practical decision would be, again, to reinstall that toggle that lets us turn the EXP share on and off. I guarantee you 90% of the complaints would stop. But that's ignoring the fact that Game Freak, the company behind the Pokemon games, have developed this really sour attitude towards their own fan base lately, using garbage or contradicting critique as a way to toss aside all critique. I don't know, maybe Game Freak is still resentful that nobody bought Harmonite or something. And the Bare Bones Diamond and Pearl remake seem to be motivated primarily by a desire to shut up those who keep asking for one, rather than continue the proud tradition of remaking old games with modern tech. And yes, Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl have the modern EXP share with no off switch and no level rebalancing, which makes me concerned that people are going to blaze through these remakes in an overleveled haze and, by the end, wonder why people consider these games to be such classics. But yeah, these original fourth generation games are classics for a reason. If you can find yourself a copy of Pokemon Platinum and a 3DS, I implore you, play that instead. It has a ton of fixes and additional content that the remakes have torn out for literally no reason, and is all around a better experience. You owe it to yourself to play the better version of this game, because if Sword and Shield's policies of letting gaping flaws in their design just sit there forever as any indication, we won't be getting a cromulent platinum anytime soon. <sighs> Thanks again for watching, and no worries, the next video gamey video I have planned will be a lot more upbeat, talking about a playthrough type I've mentioned once before, but didn't really detail that much. But until then, this is Kodak signing off.